Episode 11 begins the next morning, as Ruby wakes up and discovers she's able to see her breath in the air. She struggles to keep her eyes open and pulls herself out from between Weiss and Blake. She stumbles before making it to the couch and realizing the fire is out. Nudging Weiss with her foot, she says groggily, Weiss, you need to relight the fire. Weiss crawls into the blankets and Blake mumbles, It's too cold. Irritated but resigned, Ruby sighs and stands, using Crescent Rose as a crappy crutch to hobble over to the fireplace. She begins putting in wood and paper to burn, but pats herself down and realizes she doesn't have a lighter. She looks around the room to Roman, who is out cold, then to Mirtonaster, near Weiss, before shaking her head and calling quietly for Crow. She's met by dead quiet, save for the creaking of the house. She calls his name more loudly, and then again, louder and more panicked as she begins to hobble her way out of the room, wincing all the way to the window where Crow has set up his watch. He is motionless, and Ruby rushes to his side. She exhales with relief, discovering he's alive, but that relief turns to frustration when she sees an empty bottle of liquor on the floor and one hanging limply from his hand. Face twisting in anger, Ruby, trembling, grabs the bottle in his hand and throws it into the wall. The shattering sound wakes Crow and startles the rest of the crew, who struggle to get up. Crow, startled, looks to Ruby and says, What? Ruby, what's happening? Ruby points to his chest. What's happening? How should I know? You were supposed to be on watch! Crow rubs at one of his eyes and looks out the window. I was just resting my eyes. Ruby throws her hands to the empty bottle on the ground. That's crap, Uncle Crow! The fire's been out for hours! You were supposed to be the one stoking it! Crow shakes his head. So I screwed up a little. Is anyone hurt? Ruby's face goes red. A little? Yang and Neo have hypothermia! It was on you to make sure they were warm! I was worried! I thought you'd been eaten by a Beowulf or something! Crow laughs curtly. As if a Beowulf could get me. Ruby stomps her foot. That's not the point! Yesterday you said you'd check on the cellar, but you investigated the liquor cabinet instead. Before that you were drinking on the walk here. Before that you were hung over in a bar on a train when Adam showed up. Even back at the festival you were so drunk that John had to babysit you. You haven't stopped drinking since we got to Mistral. You don't have bad luck, Crow. You're just a useless saddled drunk. As her rant ends, she's left standing in front of him, breath ragged. Crow is stunned while the rest of the team have awoken and are peering in from the other room, drowsy but alarmed. Bitterly, Ruby continues, I can't believe I ever looked up to you. Weiss swoops into Ruby's side, taking the place of Crescent Rose as Ruby's main strut of support. Ruby, you shouldn't be standing. Ruby turns to look at Weiss and notices everyone is awake, looking shocked, and a little sobered by her overreaction. Ruby quietly says, Sorry to the crew before looking up the stairs at Maria, who's watching them from next to the study. Ruby scans the crew again. Blake shrugs and says, How about some breakfast? Yang, peeking over the couch, asks, You wanna make it? Blake deflates almost instantly. Not really. Ruby looks between them all and moves towards the kitchen. Come on, Weiss. We can have some of that jam you wanted to eat last night. We cut to outside the house, the front door opening as Crow languidly makes his way outside. Taking a deep breath, it's clear he's been shaken by Ruby's outburst. He pulls out the photo of his team and mumbles, Ah, Summer. What am I doing? We see the photo from his perspective, and when he lowers it, we see a cape-like flicker of red and white disappear behind the farm's windmill. Crow blinks and rubs his eyes. With a growing frown, he goes to investigate the windmill. We cut to Yang sitting by the fireplace, wiping a bit of jam off her face and thumb before reaching down and attaching her arm. She flexes it a few times, staring at it emptily, closing it slower and slower. Blake walks up to her and gets her attention, though it's clear that Yang is somewhat indifferent to Blake's presence. Blake says, Hey, remember what I said about the wagon in the shed? Yang, her voice hazy, replies, Not really, and pauses before, Sorry. Blake shuffles on the spot. Oh, well, I wanted to ask if you were up to working on Bumblebee. I think if we attach the wagon, we won't have to walk our way out of this. If we can get Bumblebee running, that is. Yang is slow to respond, but ultimately says, Sure. She looks to Neo, who is still warming herself next to the fire, then looks up to Roman, who is stoking the fire. Crime boss man. You got Neo duty. Roman matches her gaze and nods quietly, resting the poker down and sitting next to Neo, who curls into his side. Satisfied, Yang stands and limply points towards the door, saying, Well, lead the way. 
We cut to a slower paced montage of Maria opening the doors to the other houses and exploring within. We get cuts of her searching through books, pocketing a few, and finally stumbling upon multiple different bodies, all roughly in the same condition as the ones in the main house. She touches one of the corpses, getting the texture of the skin and frowns. Finally we cut to her finding a body against a wall, surrounded by books and papers, all messily scrawled upon. She collects the book he's holding and walks away, and as she does the camera lingers on a scrap of paper that flips over in a draft that says, Don't sleep. A special thanks goes out to all of my wonderful patrons for supporting the channel. If you like this content and want more of it, please consider supporting it. Also consider picking up my new action-adventure novel, The Artificer, which is now available for purchase on Amazon in digital and in print. With that all said, back to your regularly scheduled fixing. With Yang and Blake in the shed, Yang has just finished appraising Bumblebee. There's a number of problems all over the place, but all things considered, she could be a whole lot worse. Yang scratches at the back of her head. I could probably get it running if I could just fix the starter. Blake perks at that and says, That... that's like the battery, right? And Yang replies, Yeah? Sort of? Blake pulls out the batteries from last night and says, Would these help? Yang stares at the batteries, then to Blake, lingering on her partner. And then she says very flatly, No. Blake shrinks in embarrassment and says, Oh... Sorry. Shoving the batteries into her pocket, she looks to the tractor and asks, How about that? Yang looks at it and nods tentatively. Yeah, there should be something I can use in there. The two work in silence for a bit, and we montage to them testing the bike where it thrums to life. Both look satisfied, but not quite happy. As Yang turns off the bike, Blake pulls up the wagon to the back and notices that Bumblebee doesn't have a tow hitch. Yang reaches under the cowl and pulls out a custom curved hitch that fits into the body of the bike. Blake says, Oh. And Yang gives a weak smile. Yeah, who do you think taught Ruby? Yang pauses before muttering bitterly. And then she got way better than me. Blake responds wryly. Well, you're way better than me. Yang smiles more fully at that. Well, let's get back to the house. Scanning the rest of the room for anything useful they might have missed. If we leave soon, we can make it to Argus and... As she looks through the window towards the house, she sees Adam, standing in the snow, menacingly. Yang immediately loses any positivity, paling and locking up, the world descending into a black void with floating embers. She takes one step back and Blake puts a hand on her shoulder, getting her attention. We can hear Blake's muffled cries of Yang's name before she comes back to reality. Yang turns to Blake, breathless, and Blake asks if she's alright. Yang double takes, seeing that Adam is gone from the window, but panic is still gripping her words. Adam's here. Blake is baffled by that and replies, Adam fell straight off the cliff. Even if he survived, that was miles away. He, he couldn't be here. Yang turns and grits her teeth. I saw him on the train. He was right there, Yang says, terrified and a little guilty. If I'm wrong this time, Blake walks up and cups Yang's hands with her own and says, He's not here, Yang. But if he is, you don't need to worry. I'll protect you. Yang snaps out of her panic and yanks her hands away. She growls at Blake. I don't need your protection. Blake is stunned, verbally slapped by the outburst, and fumbles to express a coherent thought. Yeah, that's... I mean... While she's still scrambling, Yang waves her off. Forget it. We gotta warn everyone. Without another word, Yang heads out the door. Blake hesitates, but then follows. We cut to Ruby and Weiss, mid-conversation at the kitchen table as Ruby is saying, I just... feels like he's not taking anything seriously anymore. I... I don't know... As Ruby is talking, Yang comes through the front door, the sound loud enough to startle Weiss and Ruby from their conversation. Yang stomps her way into the kitchen, and both girls look up to her, though Weiss seems a little more sluggish than Ruby. Yang says, I have... Adam. I saw Adam. Ruby and Weiss jolt to a stand, Weiss accidentally knocking a plate to the floor as she finds her footing. Ruby looks between the two and immediately asks, Where is everyone? We cut to Blake and Yang checking the study, only to find Maria gone, and then jump to Ruby and Weiss getting Roman and a barely awake Neo at the fireplace. Ruby shoots a concerned look to the chair where Crow had been sitting, before shaking it off and the crew collects outside around the well. 
Weiss, who looks slightly more winded carrying Ruby, leans Ruby against the well, which prompts Ruby to shoot her a quick, confused glance before rolling it off. Ruby raises the broken crescent rose and readies it, asking, By the shed? Yang nods and Ruby keeps her gaze affixed in that direction as she follows up asking, Does anyone else know where the others went? Roman whines, pulling Neo close to his chest. Somewhere warmer than here. Can someone explain to me why we're outside? Blake turns to him and says, Yang saw Adam. Roman gives her a deadpan stare. And I care why? Neo is still freezing. We're better holding up inside. He turns to Yang. Unless you've got that bike running, Blondie, then we just get the hell out of here. Ruby hesitates, but ultimately says, We're not leaving Crow, or Miss Calavera for that matter. She looks to Yang. Yang, are you sure you saw Adam? The question is frank, but not accusatory. Yang, however, takes it as such. I know what I saw, Ruby. I... I, I know I have problems, but he was there. Ruby puts her hands up defensively as Yang gets more irritable. I, I know, Yang, but for all we know, there's more going on than we think. Maybe Emerald followed us. Weiss, thinking deeply, posits. For all we know, it could be a side effect of using the lamp. Maybe we're still in the illusion. Roman rubs his head and says, Man, that thing is more trouble than it's worth. Weiss agrees, tiredly and dryly saying, You're telling me, I spent all this time trying to find you guys again and now we're heading all the way back, and I'm no better for it. Weiss clutches the shawl around the white lily. Blake, defeated, asks, Why are we even taking that thing to Atlas anyway? It's a literal grim magnet. Ruby asks, But what about Salem? Yang replies angrily, What about Salem? Raven was right. Oz never had a plan. We signed up to save the world, not just delay the inevitable. The thing's worthless to us. Weiss slumps and absently mumbles. We probably wouldn't even be able to get it to Atlas with the blockade. Yang, clearly at her wit's end, continues. We should just drop that thing down the well. If we do that, it'll at least buy us some time to... to... I don't know. Ruby takes the relic into her hand and looks deeply into it. Weiss folds her hand over Ruby's and they meet eyes, Weiss silently communicating a lack of judgement for whatever choice Ruby makes. Ruby looks to the others and gets similar looks. She glances at it one more time before turning to hold it over the well with one hand. She hesitates, and she actually begins to pull it back when a massive wooden crack can be heard in the distance, coming from the windmill. Surprised, Ruby twists towards the sound, putting weight on her ankle. Her knees buckle, wincing in pain, and she drops the relic, which tumbles into the well. Ruby glares in the direction of the sound before staring down the pit beside her. Slowly, awareness seeps back into her eyes and what just occurred. A slow, loud scream of frustration bubbles out of her throat, startling everyone and seemingly waking them from their malaise, if only for a moment. Taking a deep breath after having a good scream, Ruby looks to her team and says, We can't leave without that. Turning to Roman, she says, We'll go down and get the relic. You try to find Crow and Miss Calavera. That sound was probably one of them. Roman rolls his eyes and carries Neo towards the house, muttering sarcastically, Probably. Yang groans. Look, I really don't want to go into that well. Blake agrees. Me neither. Ruby cuts her off, almost angrily. We're all going. One by one, the girls carefully enter the well, but we don't linger on them. Instead, we follow Roman as he sets Neo on the step beside the porch, saying, Stay put, I'll be right back. If we get cold, the fire's right around the corner. He stands to leave, and Neo catches his sleeve with her fingers. Roman looks down to her and shakes his head. It'll only be a moment, get some rest before we leave. Neo drops her hand and watches sadly as Roman walks towards the windmill. We cut to the inside of the well as Weiss and Yang drop down, while Blake lowers herself and Ruby down to the shin-high water of the tunnel. The group look around in confusion, and Blake remarks, It's a whole waterway. Weiss moves a single foot through the water, rushing around her feet. Less of a well, more of a cave. There's a current. Ruby watches the water shift around Weiss's foot with a frown. And it's strong. It's gonna make things difficult. Everyone start looking. Blake, you're in front. Give me a hand? Blake sighs and says, I guess. The quartet slowly make their way down the tunnel, shining their scroll lights into the water, struggling to find the relic. They pass a number of tunnels along the way, and Weiss comments, These probably run out of the entire farm. Blake adds, Should we be walking in this? For all we know, it was something in the water that killed everyone. Yang gives a huff of disbelief. Wouldn't they notice if something was wrong with the water? You know, dig a new well? Blake shakes her head. I... 
don't know. I don't... I don't really care. Let's just find the stupid thing. The quartet passed one of the offshoots, and a glint of gold catches Ruby's eye. She points it out and takes Blake with her as she pulls the two of them towards it. The relic is bobbing in the water, having become wedged in some fallen brick, and Ruby sighs with relief, commenting, It's more buoyant than I thought. Blake shakes her head in irritation at the comment, but lifts her gaze to further down the tunnel and blinks. She rustles Ruby's side, whispering, Ruby, as she nods down the path. Ruby turns and shines her light. The light passes over the crude cut stone of the tunnel until it catches something standing in the shadows. Gnarled, humanoid figures, skin blacker than the shadows around them, with jagged bone bursting from the seams of their body and cold, white masks creating the vaguest notions of a face. Monstrous, humanoid grim, standing listless, staring at her and Blake and the relic. With Roman, we follow him into the windmill, which is dark and stuffy, the inner mechanism eroded and creaking in the wind. As he wanders in, he almost immediately finds Crow in a pile of wooden debris, dazed from having fallen through the floor above. Roman lazily walks up to him and crosses his arms, giving him a dry look. I've heard a stumbling drunk, but did you have to take out the second floor with you? Crow shakes his head, still not quite lucid, mumbling something under his breath. As Roman pulls him to his feet, the crime lord asks, what are you saying? And Crow replies in a fit of panic. Summer. Roman raises his brow and asks, No, it's fall, you idiot. A second later, there's a slam, the door to the windmill snapping shut. Roman looks up, the light so dim that he can barely make out the figure standing beside it. Cloaked in white, the figure stands, only a small section of her jaw visible, and Crow just mutters out languidly, Where have you been? She... They needed... Needed you... Roman, slightly more alarmed by stranger danger, side-eyes Crow and says, And I need you to explain what the hell is going on! The figure strides forward, quickly opening her arms, tears dripping down her still overshadowed cheeks. Crow watches her approach, smiling softly and stumbling towards her as she comes in for an embrace. Roman watches with confusion before his eyes go wide. Crow and the figure are only inches apart when Roman slams into Crow's side and shoves him out of the way. Drawing Ozpin's cane, he holds the figure at a distance, his eyes scanning her arms and seeing small, tooth-like spikes protruding from the inside track of her hands, wrists, and biceps. Roman stands in front of Crow and mutters bitterly, You and Red need to have a long talk about self-preservation. Roman glances down to Crow for a split second, only to look up and be met with Ruby, staring at him and Crow with big, curious eyes. Roman tilts his head and says, Oh, come on, really? The new Ruby lunges forward to hug Crow, only for Roman to kick her in the gut and send her tumbling to the opposite wall. As she does, her limbs don't move like any humans should, almost boneless with every impact. There's a second's pause, and then it contorts in place, almost instantly snapping to stand like a broken puppet. Crow's eyes widen, and he instinctually draws Harbinger and fires. The shot lands on the copy's shoulder, taking its arm off completely, leaving a thick, black, goopy mess that dribbled down in its place. The thing looks down to the stump, unfazed by the missing limb, before looking up at the pair. A moment later, a bony, curved blade erupts from the stump, and the creature lunges at them. Roman and Crow roll out of the way as the creature dives past them into the shadows. Crow stares at it before shaking his head, saying, Let's get out of here before it can finish licking its wounds. Roman replies, Gladly, and rushes to the door. Back in the well, we pick up right where we left off. Ruby's eyes widen, and she hisses out, we need to leave. Now. The Grim begin to shuffle towards them, slowly, a few tripping in the water only to be crawled over by its brethren. Ruby and Blake retreat to the main shaft with Yang and Weiss. Ruby explaining, They seem slow, let's just get out of here. The group quietly makes their way towards the entrance, only to discover a number of the same Grim now illuminated as they wade into the light below the mouth of the well. The group reorient and stumble down one of the other tunnels, coming face to face with yet another horde. Yang breaks from her malaise, panic rising. What are these things? Wei steps up and slams up an ice wall between them and two of the hordes, spitting out, I don't know, but I don't want to be dealing with them. They retreat to a different tunnel, and so begin to scramble through the waterways, with every other turn being met with a fresh gaggle of grim. Fleeing gradually begins to take its toll on them, wearing them down before they turn a corner to find Maria, kneeling over a body of a dead huntsman who could be seen in the photo in the bedroom. She looks to the girls and frowns. What are you kids doing down here? Ruby replies quickly. No time to explain, we gotta get out of here. 
Maria looks behind them, sees the shambling hordes, and motions them down the other side of the cave. Come on, it's the way I came in! The group follow her, and it's smooth sailing for a few seconds, until Blake says, Oh no, pointing to a different group of Grimm blocking their path forward in the darkness. Maria mutters, Damn! And they divert, following a similar routine as earlier, running into Grimm at every other corner. Eventually, they reach a cavern that dips low, so low that they're waist-deep in water, trudging and eventually coming out higher and higher until they're on completely dry land. They arrive at another T intersection, but the fork only offers two paths laden with persistent grim. Panic begins to set in, and Blake calls for Weiss to use some dust to give them some time, but Weiss points out that she used the last of it earlier. They've been practically running on empty since the crash. Ruby opens fire on the horde, but even picking off one or two is difficult thanks to their surprising resilience. Maria is ready for them to get close, raising her sickle cane to pick them off herself, but the other three girls are having trouble standing, their faces heavy with mental exhaustion. One of Ruby's shots jam in Crescent Rose, and she begins a panic search for anything that could save them. Her eyes fall on the barely illuminated wall, squinting in the darkness. She mumbles quickly, Bricks, where have I seen these before? Blinking with an idea, she turns to Yang and shouts, Yang, punch the wall! Yang, barely conscious at this point, looks to Ruby confused. Punch it? The wall? Yang limply punches the wall, and Ruby screams, Harder, Yang! Punch it harder! Yang scrunches her face in concentration and rage. There's a flicker of fire, and with a solid punch, she bursts through the wall, revealing the cellar underneath Brunswick's house. Ruby gives a sigh of relief and orders everyone into the cellar. Go on ahead! Get up the stairs! Maria leads the group towards the door, followed by the sluggish Yang and Weiss. Yang gets halfway into the room before her legs give out, slumping against a support pillar before collapsing in a dead heap. Weiss moves to help her, but as soon as she kneels, her strength leaves her and she falls beside Yang, unable to move. Ruby grimaces, limping forward to help them, trying to drag Blake with her as she does. Blake is firing into the crowd with Gamble, only for her gun to go dry with several empty clicks. As Ruby keeps trying to pull, Blake lets go and falls to the ground, making Ruby tumble into the cellar alone. Voice tired and strained, Ruby begs, Blake, get up, please. Blake sighs, muttering, It's... fine. Ruby looks to the rest of her team for help, but only finds Maria trying to help Weiss and Yang up. She looks as the Grim clutter around Blake, who has closed her eyes, and in a flash of frames we get glimpses of Ruby's time together with Blake. She screams Blake's name, and the white flashes from her eyes, causing the Grim to recoil. Maria, hearing this and seeing the flash, turns to Ruby in surprise. She drops Weiss and shuffles as best she can over to Ruby's side. Ruby? What color are your eyes? Ruby tiredly whispers, Silver? Maria grips Ruby's head and tells Ruby, You have family, friends? Ruby asks confused, What? She stares at the still approaching Grimm, and Maria yanks her head so she's looking towards the ceiling. Don't think about them. Think about the people who you love. Focus on the thought of them, the way they make you feel. Ruby closes her eyes and conjures up those feelings, those moments, and we get small flickers of her time with her team at the festival of the bracelets she bought and gave to her team. She wraps her hand around the bracelets on her wrist and brings them up to her chest. Life is beautiful. It's precious. Focus! Ruby's eyes open and flood the room with light, tears dripping down her cheeks. The grim beyond are burned away in a flash of white, leaving only bones behind. As they dully clatter to the floor, Yang, Weiss, and Blake all begin to stir to wakefulness, free from whatever force was affecting them. Ruby, exhausted, lets her head fall back into Maria's lap. She asks, Who are you? Maria pats Ruby's cheeks and says, We're not out of the woods yet, kiddo. We can talk about it later. Pulling Ruby to her feet, the group rushes to the exit of the cellar. We cut back to Roman and Crow, fleeing from the windmill, the camera following from behind. It swings in front of them, angling up to see the top of the windmill, where the gnarled copy of Ruby has clawed out on top. It leaps from the windmill off-screen, in the direction of the house, and our two characters are none the wiser. Roman and Crow scramble to the door of the house, Roman instantly noting that Neo isn't there. They burst through the door, Crow shutting it and barricading it with his body. Roman immediately looks to the now-dying fire where there is still no Neo, and his breath quickens. Crow peers out the nearest window and says, I don't think it followed us. Roman replies, heading towards the stairs, There could be more. Crow asks where he's going, and he says, I gotta find her, you check downstairs! Crow stares after him, but quickly pushes away from the door and walks towards the kitchen, blade drawn. 
We follow Roman upstairs as he kicks open the door to the study, calling Neo's name. In quick succession he stomps down the hall, kicking open door after door. At the master bedroom, he walks in, his voice becoming more and more panicked as he calls for Neo. After checking the ensuite bathroom, he turns to leave, only to find Neo in the doorway, looking at him quizzically. Roman lets out a sigh of relief and says, Neo, you're okay. You're... perfectly fine. Neo cocks her head as Roman narrows his eyes and draws Ospin's cane. He steps forward, raising the cane to strike, but Crow's voice carries on from below. Hey, Roman! Roman looks away for only a second, but when he looks back, he's met with the childish eyes of Ave Brunswick. Roman locks in place, his eyes sinking, his arm frozen. The creature stands there, staring at him, but steps forward, raising its arms. Roman's face is conflicted, his arms shaking and his eyes trembling. The creature takes one more step, only to stop with the sound of a blade entering the flesh. The camera pans down to a blade sticking through the creature's chest, pulling back up to reveal Neo skewering it with her umbrella sword. The creature goops almost instantaneously to be facing Neo instead. Neo's eyes widen in shock and panic as she stabs it, again, and again. The creature weakly raises its arms to wrap around Neo, but Neo just keeps stabbing it, over and over again, pushing it to the floorboards and straddling it where it becomes a destabilized, goopy mess before finally disintegrating under the repeated trauma. As the flecks of darkness wash away in a draft, Roman falls to his knees and drops his cane, unable to process what just happened. There is quiet until Neo coughs and slumps against her blade, still impaled in the floorboards. Roman breaks from his stupor and scrambles to support Neo, pulling her into a hug and holding her close. As they're hugging, he glances to Ospin's cane, glaring for only a moment before softening and holding Neo just that much tighter. We jump to Crow at the bottom of the stairs, yelling up, Hey, are you two alright up there? There's an extended pause before Roman yells out, We're fine, we'll be down in a minute. Crow exhales and walks back towards the kitchen, going to open the cellar door and finish his check on the lower floor. Instead, the door slams open into Crow's face. He stumbles back onto his ass, gripping his nose as Maria rushes past him, carrying Ruby over her shoulder. She spares him a glance and says, No time to sit down, young man! We need to move! Here, carry your daughter! Crow blinks in surprise as Ruby is roughly tossed into his hands, barely given time to sputter. What? But she's not... What's happening? As the other three members of Team Ruby rush past him. We cut to a quick montage of the team gathering their effects from the house, taking everything outside where Yang is wheeling up Bumblebee in the attached wagon near the well. As they load it up, we find Roman staring at the house in silent, enraged contemplation. We focus down on his hand where a Molotov cocktail is nudged between his fingers. He looks over to find Ruby, balancing on Crescent Rose, pushing the Molotov into his palm. With a bit of trepidation, he takes it, and they share a glance before he pulls out his lighter and hands it to her, silently letting her do the honor. Ruby smiles, lights the wick, and Roman chucks the Molotov at the house. The two stand there watching the house begin to burn, before they turn their backs on it and Roman supports Ruby on their way back to the wagon. We cut to black, ending the episode.